So we're going to do this. We're going to continue the series of lessons that we've been talking about for a few weeks now, personal responsibilities. We live in a very irresponsible generation. Would you agree with that? I mean, there are just a huge number of people that don't want to assume the responsibilities that are theirs. And so we've been talking about this for quite some time. And, you know, sometimes it's because the generation before this one didn't teach this generation to be responsible. Would you say that we live in a spoiled generation for the most part? Where parents bought into Dr. Spock and all that stuff and, and didn't, you know, didn't want to discipline their children, didn't want to go to some pretty severe measures at times to teach children to be responsible. And if children don't learn to be responsible when they're children, they grow up to be irresponsible adults. Isn't that what we're seeing? We're seeing the fruit of that. You know, but Dr. Spock said, don't discipline your children. You may squelch their personality. My mama and my daddy squelched my personality all over the place when I was growing up. And I hope yours did too. Um, but let's look at this, personal responsibilities. Now, we, we, we kind of base this sermon on some words that Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia. In Galatians chapter 6, we're going to read verse 2, the first part of it, and then down in verse number 5. He says two things that seem to be contradictory unless we understand the definition of the words that he uses. First of all, he says in verse 2, carry each other's burdens. So there are some things that you are supposed to carry for other people. And then he says, each one should carry their own load. So there are certain things that you are responsible to carry for yourself, and you're not supposed to try to push that off on somebody else to carry it for you. Everybody should help somebody else carry their burdens, but we should all carry our own load. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you because you're good and you're kind and you're gracious. You're always more than enough. Father, you, you have just blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And Father, if we're not the recipients of your storehouse of blessings, it's simply because we will not receive it. You offer it to us, Lord. And so I pray that today, you, as you offer us blessing from your word, that we would have open hearts and that we would actually receive what you have for us today from Scripture. You say that your word is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, that it pierces all the way down to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints in the marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our heart. Father, I pray that we will just open our hearts and let your word do what it will do for us if we are willing. Lord, just work in us today to bring about life change. Continue the process of conforming us into the men and women that you want us to be. Conform us to the image of your son. Lord, I pray that you will transform us by the renewing of our mind because I know that's your will. In Jesus' name and for his sake, and amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to look at this. Now, the scripture verses that we're going to look at today are printed in your bulletin, and they're also going to be on on the screen overhead, but I want to remind you, and I, I say some of these things every week to kind of introduce each uh, new sermon in this series, but followers of Jesus often find it difficult to define what is their personal responsibility and what is not. Have you been there? What am I supposed to do for somebody else and what am I not supposed to do for them? Sometimes that's a little difficult <coughs> for us to determine. And that's not a new problem. It goes all the way back to the first century among Christians. Paul wrote to the believers in the churches of Galatia to help them clarify this very issue. And you see, if it wasn't a problem back then, then he wouldn't have written to them about it. And, and, and I want you to remind you now, first he wrote, carry each other's burdens. We have a responsibility to help people carry a burden, and, and we need to understand what that is. But then three verses later, he said each one should carry their own load. That's in verse 5. So that sounds a little contradictory until you clearly define the difference between a burden and a load. The Greek word translated burden refers to a load that's too heavy for one person to safely carry. Sometimes the crises and the, and the, the, the difficulties and, and the problems in life are too heavy for one person to carry alone. When it becomes a burden, when it reaches that level of difficulty, then, then we need to step in and help that person carry that because trying to carry a burden by yourself is like trying to carry a boulder by yourself. It would be dangerous. It could 
crush you. We need help with burdens. We need help with the crises and tragedies of life that have the potential to overwhelm us and crush us. That's what Paul was referring to when he wrote, carry each other's burdens. Carry those for other people. At least help them carry them. But then look, on the other hand, the Greek word translated load refers to the personal belongings that a first century travel, traveler would have carried in a backpack. And God makes each of us responsible for carrying the contents of our own backpack. Do you get that? There's some personal stuff that you're supposed to carry and you don't need to expect somebody else to carry that for you. There's stuff in your backpack that you need to carry. Now, here's a problem with some of us. Some of us have put some stuff in our backpack that don't need to be there. And then we wonder why we have trouble carrying it and we're weighed down because we got stuff in our backpack that don't need to be there. You need to make sure that the stuff that you're carrying is really your stuff to carry and then you need to assume the responsibility of carrying that. That's what Paul was talking about when he said each one should carry their own load. We've already looked at several components of an individual's personal load, your personal responsibilities to carry, things like the consequences of your actions, your ongoing basic needs, your pursuit of personal truth, the training of your children, the discipline of your children, choosing your companions and controlling your thoughts. We've already looked at all of those. And today we're going to look at two more. And here's what they are. Identifying and using your talents. That is part of your load. You're supposed to identify and utilize for God's kingdom the talents that he has designed into you. And then we are supposed to identify and utilize our gifts. And we're going to talk about the difference between a gift and a talent today. But we are responsible to identify and use our gifts for his kingdom. And we are responsible to identify and utilize our gifts for his kingdom. That's part of our personal load. Nobody else can do that for you. Nobody else can determine what you're talented at. Some people can stop by and look at you when you're in action and say, wow, he's really good at that. But you have to decide that you're good at that. Get past this inferiority complex. Oh, me, I can't do anything. That makes me nauseous. That means that God created something that was useless. And he didn't. Do you understand that? Get past that. And then identify and utilize your gifts. God has gifted every one of us to do something for him. And we're going to talk about those two things today. By the way, I want to explain that talents, when I talk about a talent in this sermon, I'm referring to special physical and mental abilities that God gives us. There are some special inborn mental and physical abilities that God gives each one of us. And then that's a talent. And then, and when I talk about gifts, then I am talking about special spiritual abilities that God gives us. Now, let me help you differentiate between a talent and a gift. Talents can be developed and improved. You get that? If it's a talent, you have an aptitude for it, God has created you physically to be able to do it. He has given you the mental prowess to be able to do it. But it's up to you to not only identify it, but to improve on it. Talents can be um, improved and developed. Gifts, on the other hand, are fully developed and functional when they are given. And they are spiritual in nature. A talent is something that's physical and mental. A gift is something that is spiritual. A talent can be developed and improved. A gift is fully functional and developed in your spirit the moment God gives it to you. You understand what I'm saying? So you don't have to learn a gift. You may have to learn a talent, or you may at least have to hone a talent. But a gift is given, and it's given fully functional and fully developed, and it is something that's part of your spirit, where a talent is something that's part of your mind and your physical being. So let's talk about this now that I've tried to help distinguish between the two. Let's talk about identifying your talents and using your talents. Jesus included that. 
He included identifying and using your God-given talents as part of the load that each of us, each believer, is to carry when he told the story of the three servants. He told the story about three different servants. The story starts like this. It's in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 15. He said, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants, and there were three of them. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. Now, I want you to get that. Three servants, one master. The master is about to go on a journey. While he's gone, he gives his servants some money. And he expects them to utilize his money for him while he is gone. Does that sound familiar to you? Does that sound something like the Lord Jesus has done for each one of us? He has given us certain abilities, certain talents, certain mental and, and physical abilities, and he's gone on a long journey all the way to heaven and back. And when he comes back, he's going to settle up with us, and he is either going to reward us or judge us based on how did we utilize what he left us? Now look, this master gave them, he entrusted to them his money. There are certain talents, certain mental and physical abilities that God has designed into you. He gave it to you. You can't really take any credit for it, but he wants you to develop it. He wants you to improve it. He wants you to utilize it for his kingdom while he's gone. And when he comes back, there will be a reckoning about how well you did or did not do that with these talents that you were given. So then look, he gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the lost. To, excuse me, to the last. Thank you. To the last. Okay? So did he give them all the same talents? No. Did he give them all the same level, the same amount of talent? No. He did not. You say, well, he must have liked one of those guys better than the other. That had nothing to do with it. They were all his servants. As far as we know, they, they were, had, had all behaved well. I mean, we're not given any information about them. We can't make any assumptions about why he gave different ones a different amount of his wealth other than what he said. Look at this. Dividing it in proportion to their abilities. Then he left on his trip. You get that? God has designed you with certain, what? Abilities. We call those talents. He has designed those in to you. That's what King David was talking about, at least part of what he was talking about, when he said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and that my soul knows right well. Your works are perfect. You get that? He didn't design us all the same way. He's a God of remarkable ingenuity and remarkable variety. I mean, look around a room. No two of us are just alike. Anybody's designed into every one of us something that we can do that nobody else can do the way we can do it. He's designed that mental aptitude and that physical aptitude into every one of us. We need to be concerned about identifying what that is and then pursuing the development of it and the improvement of it so that we can use it for the maximum benefit of his kingdom. Because what's the most important thing to God on this planet? His kingdom. How do I know that? In the Sermon on the Mount, the only full-length sermon that we have that Jesus preached, you know what he said? Seek first, this is the climax verse of the sermon, seek first, what? His kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you as well. So what was he saying there? My highest priority for the people on earth is my kingdom. So if God has designed into us certain talents, certain mental and physical abilities, then God wants us to use those for his kingdom because that's his highest priority. You get that? And when we use them the way we're supposed to, and the master comes back to settle accounts someday, to whatever degree we have used those talents the way we're supposed to, to that degree the master will say to us, and we'll see this in just a moment, well 
done. Good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Do you get that? So when you identify your talents, your, your God-given natural abilities, and you put them to work in the kingdom, then, then God's going to come around periodically, evaluate what you're doing, and if you're really using it for his kingdom, and, and you're advancing his kingdom because of what he has entrusted to you in the area of these natural abilities, these physical and mental talents, then he's going to give you a greater opportunity, the opportunity to do even more for him. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? <laughs> but let's go ahead and look what he says here. Evidently, their master held them responsible for using these abilities, these talents, to enlarge his estate. The first two servants used their abilities well, and they were rewarded. God wouldn't reward them if they weren't doing what he had told them to do. They knew what they were supposed to do with what he gave them, and they chose to do it. Here's the thing. They were rewarded. Their, their master said to them in Matthew chapter 25, verses 21, and then he said the same thing in verse number 23 to the guy that was given five bags of silver and the guy that was given two bags of silver. He said the same thing. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount. So now think about that. Think about how wealthy this master was. Five bags of silver and two bags of silver, a total of seven bags of silver, and to him that was what? Small amount. How wealthy do you have to be for seven bags of silver coins to be just a small amount? Get that? I don't consider that a small amount, do you? But in comparison to what God has, that was just a drop in the bucket. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Everything in heaven and earth belongs to him. And so he says to them, you've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? When you do faithfully, dependably, consistently what you're supposed to do with the natural and mental abilities God has given you, then he promises that I'll come around periodically and settle up with you and I will increase your opportunity to do even more. And you say, well, God never gives me the opportunity to do anything. Think about it. You're evidently not doing what you're supposed to be doing today if God didn't even given you an opportunity to do something more tomorrow. Isn't that what he said there? And some people say, well, I tell you what, man, when I get past this chapter of my life, when I get here, when I get there, when I get somewhere else, I tell you what, I'm going to do something for Jesus. Listen, you ain't going to do nothing for Jesus tomorrow if you're not doing something for Jesus today. You get that? Bloom where you're planted. Somebody's saying, I can't wait to get out of here so I can go... Bloom where you're planted. Do what you're supposed to be doing today, and God will give you more opportunity tomorrow. Use those God-given abilities for his glory, for the advancement of his kingdom. The third servant didn't use his abilities at all. A lot of folks in the world like that today claim to be Christians. Not doing anything for Jesus never thinking about his kingdom. I was in Harp's grocery store yesterday. Miss Jenny sent me, she loves me, so she sent me out in that 13 degree weather to Harp's. That's not exactly true. <laughs> she sent me to get what I wanted for a Valentine's dessert. <laughs> so I probably should confess that. So, but while I was there, I bought her, I was looking for a dozen roses, but I could only find 11 was a little pot of miniature rose bush only had 11 roses on it I don't know what to tell you she got 11 roses cost me less than five dollars that amazing so here's what I want you to understand here's what I want you to understand we better get back to the sermon don't you think here's here's what I want you to understand I want you to understand that this this third servant didn't use his abilities at all and he was judged along with being called wicked and lazy. The master said it in verse number 26, the last part of the verse of Matthew 25. You wicked and lazy servant. 
You know what that means? When God looks at us and we have believed in him and received his incredible gift of eternal life, we are his servants. And God looks at us and he sees us not doing anything with those mental and physical abilities that he has designed into us. And we are not using them for the development of his kingdom. You know what he, how he sees us? Number one, wicked. Well, let me ask you this. Can God bless wickedness? It's against his character. He cannot be God and bless wickedness. And people say, I don't know why God don't bless me. I said, what are you doing for him? This woman, I was started to tell you this a while ago. I was in Harps yesterday, and there was a grandma and a mom and a little girl. And the little girl said, Grandma, what are you going to do tomorrow? She said, what day is tomorrow? I mean, she's a little irritated that the kid even asked. She was a hillbilly type woman. What day is tomorrow, she said. Little girl said, Sunday. Well, if it's Sunday, I'm going to church tomorrow. Little girl looks up to her mama and says, can we go to church tomorrow? Her mama said, tomorrow's Valentine's Day. I don't feel too churchy tomorrow. I had to bite my tongue. I wanted to say, one of these days you're going to be in hell and you are not going to feel like very hellish, but that's where you're going to be. Do you understand that? I didn't say it, but you don't know how bad I wanted to tell her that. What's the issue here? The issue here is that it is wicked not to do what God tells you to do. Not to use those God-given abilities that he's designed in you to do what he wants you to do while you're here on planet Earth and leave this place a better place because you were here than if you had never been here to get as many people to heaven as you can, to change lives so that those people can then begin the process of getting even more people to heaven. If you're not using your God-given natural abilities to do that, he says you are wicked. Now, we don't define wicked that way, do we? When we think about wicked, we think about the, the pedophile and we think about the serial murderer and we think about maybe somebody with an alternative lifestyle. We think about all that stuff and we say, oh, that's wicked. God gets a little more personal than that, doesn't he? He says, just don't use the abilities I've designed into you to do what you're supposed to be doing for me. And from his vantage point, that is wicked. And then here, I think this, this next thing that he says tells us why most people don't use their God-given talents, their abilities, physical and mental, for his kingdom. Because he says, look, you wicked and... What's that next word? Lazy servant you know why most people don't do what they're supposed to be doing for jesus we are stricken with an epidemic of laziness in the human race are you aware of that most people don't want to work you say i can't believe you said that just do a little research and find out how many people today are on welfare how many able-bodied people are on welfare are on some kind of disability so I want to stay home and draw a check. I know I'm getting on some people today. I, it's not personal. It's just the truth. Do you get that? Lazy. We don't do what God wants us to do with our God-given abilities often because we are simply lazy. And God doesn't paint a pretty picture of lazy people in Scripture, does he? He calls them sluggards, sloths. The laziest animal on the planet hangs upside down on the same branch it was born on its whole life. It's so lazy that it generally dies of parasitic infection because it's too lazy to pick the blood suckers off itself. They will suck so much blood out of it, he becomes so weak, he falls from the branch he was born on to the ground and hits the ground dead. Now, friends, that is lazy. That's how God views us, when we simply are too lazy to do with our natural abilities what he has designed us to do. So the conclusion of the story, the story of the three servants, clearly indicates that using our God-given talents for the Lord is part of our load to carry. Jesus concluded with these words. It's in Matthew 25, verse 29. To those who use well 
what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. So what is that? Use your talents for his kingdom and for his glory, and what's going to happen? He's going to give you more. But then look. But from those, here it is, who do nothing, from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. That's pretty clear, isn't it? So does God take this thing about using your talents, your natural, physical, and mental abilities, does God take that serious? He does, doesn't he? Basically what he says in that is, if you don't, lose, if you don't use it, what will happen? You'll lose it. He'll take it away and give it to somebody else that will use it. So that's using, identifying and using your talents. Now, let's look at identifying and using your gifts. Peter included this, this idea of identifying and using your God-given gifts as a part of the load each believer is to carry. This is what he wrote. He wrote this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 10. Each of you. Now, he's writing to Christians here. And when he says each of you, who does he include? Every Christian, every single one of us, no excuses. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Look at that. When you use whatever gift God has given you, when you use that gift, as a faithful steward, a steward was a, was a household slave that was entrusted with a portion of his master's wealth and expected to invest it wisely and, and bring an increase to his master's estate. He says, if you do that, if you use whatever gift you have received to serve others, it's not about you, it's about somebody else, to serve others, and you do that as a faithful, dependable, consistent, reliable steward, a, a servant, of God's grace in its various forms, he says that's what you ought to be doing. And somebody will say, but I don't have the spiritual gift. Well then, if you're right, God lied. Because he says, who's supposed to do this? Each one. So for you to declare that God somehow overlooked you and didn't give you a gift means that God lied here. Does God lie? No, then you have a gift to use. Each one should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. We are to use our gifts to serve others. That's pretty clear. Obviously, we can't effectively use our gifts unless we identify the gifts that we've been given. So in this section of today's sermon, all I have time to do is give you a brief overview of the three kinds of gifts that are mentioned in Scripture. There are three separate categories of gifts that are mentioned in Scripture. And if you don't see that and you don't understand that there's three separate categories, then you'll get all confused because you're supposed to do something different with these different kinds of gifts. And they're given for different purposes. But there's three separate categories. Hopefully, this information will provide a foundation for you to begin the process of identifying and using the gifts that God has given you to serve others, not to make you look good, not so that people think, oh, how spiritual he is. It's not about any of that. It's about serving others. It's about doing in the lives of other people what God wants done for them so they can become everything they're supposed to be. So three distinct categories of gifts. I want to give them to you. They're going to be listed there on the screen for you at the bottom of the screen. They're also in your bulletin. The first one is what I call grace gifts. I call them that because these gifts are purely the result of God's grace to us. Just his grace to us. We don't deserve it, but God gives it to us anyway. They are listed for us and described for us in Romans chapter 12, verses 3 to 8. That's one category of gifts. And there are seven of those, by the way. And then there are ministry gifts. Sometimes people call these spiritual gifts. But remember, all of the gifts are have to do with your spirit. There's something that God designs and develops into your spirit. And so there are these ministry gifts there. They're described for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 all the way down to the end of chapter 14. Three chapters devoted to these spiritual gifts in the book of 1 Corinthians. And I have to stop and tell you this. I'm amazed at how many people take the book of 1 Corinthians and pull isolated, out-of-context verses out of those chapters and say, look here, here, this is what we do. This is what the Bible says we'll be doing about spiritual gifts. What they don't understand is the church at Corinth was grossly 
grossly misusing these spiritual gifts. And most of what he wrote in those three chapters was corrective in nature. He was actually saying, this is what you're saying. Don't do this. You ought to be doing this. So be careful when you study those chapters and understand that it is corrective in nature. And then the third category, I call these people gifts. Because these are actually gifted people given as gifts to the church. To equip the church to do the ministry God wants it to be. These, these, that's what these are. And they're, they're listed in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. So we need to fasten our seatbelts and really go through these, the, uh, an overview of these three categories of gifts and go through them carefully. First, let's talk about these grace gifts out of Romans chapter 12. These gifts are special gifts given by God that determine how his people view any given situation. It determines your perspective. You only have one of these gifts, and that gift will determine your perspective. They determine our perspective on what is happening around us, and therefore, they determine how we will respond because you respond to every situation based on your perspective, the way you see that situation. And so if we have seven people in a room, and something happens in that room, and all seven of us have a different one of these grace gifts, we're all going to see that from a slightly different perspective, and we're all going to respond slightly differently to that situation. And when we have all of the gifts operating, and we got all of these perspective we've got a full picture of what happened and what really needs to be done but we don't all do it the same way because we all have a slightly different perspective there are seven of these gifts and each believer has only one paul listed these gifts in romans chapter 12 verses 6 to 8 look what he said we have different gifts according to the what grace given to each of us. That's why I call them grace gifts. What determines what gift you have and that you even have one? Grace. That's why I call them grace gifts. According to the grace given to each of us, if your gift is prophesying, which means just teaching, proclaiming the word of God, explaining the mind of God on any given issue, primarily based on scripture, what does he say here? If your gift is prophesying, then do what? Prophesy in accordance with your faith. Get that? If your gift, is gift singular or plural? Singular indicating what? You only have one. And if it, your gift, if it is prophesying, then what are you supposed to do? Prophesy. You're supposed to just try to explain to people the mind of God based on the word of God. You don't need to get involved in everything else. Just do what you are gifted to do. You know what happens when people start trying to function in an area they're not gifted to function in? Problems. That's exactly what happens. So if your gift is prophesying, if, if it's that, then prophesy according to your faith. If it, singular or plural? Singular. If it is serving, then what? Serve. If it, singular or plural, singular, if it is teaching, then what? Teach. If it is to encourage, then what? Give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, then do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. I could preach for weeks on just that section of scripture, but we don't have time to do that. But I do have the, a moment here to explain to you that you only have one of these gifts because you only have one perspective. You get that? How you look at any situation will be determined, will determine or be determined by which one of these gifts that you have. These seven grace gifts are prophesying, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leading, and mercy. Now, let me tell you, most of the conflict that I have ever seen in churches comes about because people don't understand these gifts. You get that? Because something happens in the church, and if somebody has the gift of prophecy, prophets tend to see everything in black and white, there's no gray. It's either right or it's wrong. They're usually very vocal, and they usually are quick to hand out discipline. Get that? That's, isn't that the way the prophets are? Very vocal, very black and white, very right and wrong. They see everything in that 
from that filter, the filter of that gift. And so if somebody does something in the church and, the, and they shouldn't be doing it, you know, the prophet's going to say, you know, when they come whining to them, the prophet is going to say, well, quit sinning. Quit doing what you're doing. Look at what you're doing. How could not God not judge you for doing that? You know, straighten up your act. Get your stuff together. That's the prophet's response. Don't we need that sometimes? How many of you are willing to say, I wish somebody had done that for me 30 years ago? We, right? We need that. But if, if a person with the gift of mercy is standing in the room, you know what the gift of mercy is? I hurt when you hurt. I, I feel bad when you feel bad. It's the motivation to want to relieve your pain and relieve your suffering. And the person with the gift of mercy, if they don't understand these gifts, are going to be mortified that the person with the gift of prophecy would actually say that to this person. How unchristian is that? You get that? But if we understand that person has one gift, they see this from this perspective, I have another gift. Mine, mine is not mercy, by the way, but if it was mercy, and then I have a slightly different perspective, my response, my perspective, their response, their perspective is going to be different. Neither one of them are wrong. It's just a different approach to that person. And if we got all seven gifts dealing with that person, that person's going to get everything they need. Does that make sense to you? And so, anyway, that's, that's why it's important that we understand these grace gifts. Then the conflict doesn't have to get completely out of hand. That mercy person doesn't have to stomp off and go find another church because those people are just way too judgmental. No. They just have, the, somebody has the gift of prophecy in that church. The, gift, the person with the gift of mercy ought to be saying, man, they got, a, they got a fella or they got a woman in that church with the gift of prophecy, and they need me there. <laughs> To pour the oil in after they've cut them to pieces. <laughs> you get that? We all need each other. We need all the gifts in the church. We know all the perspectives and give everybody what they need when they need it. And so we need to, we need to do that. We need to learn that we got to identify our gifts. And one gift that you have, and only one of these, is one of these grace gifts. And then in addition to a grace gift, Everybody has at least one, maybe more than one, spiritual gift, ministry gift is what I call them, because they, the grace gifts helps you determine the perspective on how ministry ought to take place, and the spiritual gift gives you the spiritual ability to actually do the ministry. Okay, let's show you. Let me show you these. These gifts are special supernatural abilities given by God to equip his people to serve in specific ministries to build up his church. You get that? Using your spiritual gift along with your grace gift the way you're supposed to always results in the church being built up. It can be built up numerically through evangelism. This is one of the ways the church needs to be built up, right? It needs to get bigger in body count, right? Because what happens when the church gets bigger in body count? That means more people are being saved. More people are being baptized. More people are deciding to follow Jesus. Isn't that why we're here? So it needs to be built up that way. And so we need to be concerned about how many people we are impacting. Sometimes people talk to me and they say, you're just a numbers guy. You're just concerned about numbers. And I say, well, I'm not concerned only about numbers, but yes, I am concerned about numbers. You know why? Every number represents a person that we are impacting. And then, because I'm in the flesh most of the time, then when they tell me that you're just a numbers guy, then I say, that's because I serve a numbers God. He wrote a whole book about them in the Old Testament, and he even gave it the title, Numbers. God is concerned about numbers. Because every number represents a human being that has an eternal soul that's either going to heaven or going to hell. And we need to be concerned about numbers as well. So just get that. I just threw that in. That's really not in the notes anywhere. Um, and so anyway, here, here, are the, here are the ministry gifts. Paul wrote about those. We, we can build up the church numerically, and we can also build up the church spiritually. In fact, if we don't build up the church numerically, it's probably not, I mean, spiritually, it's probably not going to be built up numerically. If we don't have people having spiritual growth that then develop a heart of love for people who are unbelievers yet, 
we're probably not going to reach them. Get that? That's why some of you were out there yesterday in the blistering cold. Because you understand how important it is that we try to reach people in whatever way we can. So here, here it is. Paul wrote this. It's in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 7. He wrote, there are different kinds of gifts. So God, again, is a God of great variety when it comes to these spiritual gifts, these spiritual supernatural abilities to do things for him. He says there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. One Holy Spirit gives them all out. You want a spiritual gift? Guess where you're getting it? You're getting it from the Holy Spirit or you ain't going to get it at all. Get that? And so there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service. Your spiritual gifts determines what service you ought to render. What ministry you ought to be in is determined not only by your grace gift, that gives you a perspective, but then it's determined, the actual ability, the spiritual ability to do this ministry, it's determined by your spiritual gift. And so there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. We don't all serve the same way, do we? Some of you serve in this ministry, others serve in another ministry, somebody serves in a different ministry. But we're all serving the same Lord, and we serve in different ministries based on what spiritual gifts we have. Whether it's one or a combination of them, God equips us with spiritual gifts to serve in a particular ministry. But it's the same Lord, and there are different kinds of working, even those of you who serve in the same ministry. Because of the gifts you have, don't serve in that ministry the same way. Do you get that? A combination of your talents and your spiritual gifts just perfectly suits you to serve in a ministry, in a particular function, doing a particular kind of work. Do you get that? Some of you, let's, let's, for example, our, our food distribution ministry. Some of you, you, you're motivated to come and put those bags together, right? Some of the rest of you could care less about putting those bags together. You want to come and give it away. Some of us want to come and we don't care really about giving the food bags out to people. We want to talk to them before they get there and tell them the Jesus story. And, and you understand what I'm saying? I mean, it's just all different. The work that we do in the ministry is determined by the particular combination of spiritual gifts that we have. So then look at what he says. But in all of them, all of these gifts, and in every one, oh, that word everyone, what does that mean? Every Christian has at least one, maybe more, of these gifts. But in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. You know what? He also, Paul is a, a master at just weaving all kinds of teaching into his sentences. You know what you find in these verses that we've already read? The Spirit distributes them. The Lord determines the service, and God is the one who is at work in all of it. What do you got there? You have the Trinity right there, don't you? You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all working together in the distribution and the utilizing and an overseeing of these gifts. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit, the, the manifestation, the word manifest means to make it known, to reveal it. So the Holy Spirit is revealed. Each one of us, uh, the, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit, that's a gift. You know how you can really tell if the Holy Spirit is working in somebody? Are they utilizing a spiritual gift? That's how you tell. They say, oh man, he's a spirit-filled Christian. He comes to church every day, every Sunday. He's here when the doors are open. Humbug. I know some very carnal, unspiritual people that go to church every time the doors are open because they want to be in control. That has nothing to do with spirituality. Do you understand what I'm saying? But when somebody has a spiritual gift and they're using that and other people are standing by saying, wow, look how gifted they are to do that, that is what reveals the Holy Spirit. At work. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given, here it is, for the common good. When you use your spirit, everybody's, I mean, when you use your spiritual gift, everybody's blessed. What does the common good mean? It means all of us. When you use your gift the way you're supposed to use your gift, all of us are blessed by that. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. 
So when you use your spiritual gift, it's either going to be making the church bigger numerically, built up in that way, or deeper spiritually, built up in that way. Paul gave us a list of 13 of these ministry gifts when he wrote 1 Corinthians chapters 12 to 14. I'm going to just give you the list real quick. He gave wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, speaking in different kinds of tongues or languages, interpretation of tongues, helping, guidance, hope, and love. And just go through those three chapters and you'll find at least those, um, at least those 13. You may go through and say, oh, I found another one. That's okay. That's all right. But I'm telling you that those are listed in, the, in, this, in those chapters. And so everybody has at least one of those, maybe a combination of those. Now let's look at the third kind of gift. I call them people gifts. These gifts are actually four kinds of gifted people that God gives to his church as gifts to them to equip his people to do ministry. God gives certain gifted people as gifts to his churches. And you know what their role is supposed to be? Equip his people to do ministry. Their role is not supposed to be do all the ministry. It's to be equipping the saints, equipping God's people to do the ministry. Paul wrote about it in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. He wrote, Christ himself gave the apostles. What were apostles? People. Certain gifted people. And prophets. Again, certain gifted people. And evangelists, certain gifted people. And pastors and teachers, and if you could read that in Greek, it's like pastors slash teachers. It was all one thing. It wasn't two different ones. It's all one thing. So all these are different kinds of people that God gives his church. You get that? Do all these people do the same thing? They don't, at least they don't do it in all the same way, do they? They serve in different ways. They are gifted people serving in different ways, given as gifts to the church. And then here's why he gave them. Look at the end of verse 12. So that the body of Christ may be built up. Oh, I, I skipped a section of that. To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. So why did he give these four kinds of people to his church? To equip his people to do the ministry, to do the works of service. Why? What's the result? When the people in the church start doing the ministry instead of a few um, select people trying to do all the ministry, when we multiply the number of people doing ministry that are qualified and, and equipped to do ministry, what's the result? More ministry gets done. And the more ministry that gets done, the more the body of Christ is built up, the more the church is built up. So the four kinds of gifted people that God placed in the first century church were apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip his people for works of service, to train God's people to do ministry, not to do ministry for them. Get that? If, the, if, if, if those people in this church that are, are God's gifts to this church to equip us for the works of service, if, if those people are doing what they're supposed to be doing, they are always working themselves out of a job. You get that? They're always training and equipping somebody else to do this so I can go do something else. And then I train and equip somebody to do this so then I can go do something else. And we have people in our church that are supposed to be doing exactly that, and every church has it. Now, here's the conclusion. Every believer... Every believer has been given physical and or mental talents, special abilities that they need to identify, develop, and improve. And they have been given some combination of spiritual gifts, a grace gift, one, maybe multiple spiritual gifts, which then maybe makes you one of these gifted people given to your church to equip others. But, but, but God has done that. And that's what motivated King David to pray this because King David figured it out. I've got natural talents. I've got spiritual gifts. Wow, look what God can do with me because of what God designed into me. And what all did King David do? Led the nation of Israel to its height 
as a world superpower and the wealthiest nation on the planet during his reign. That's what King David did. Was God able to do something with this guy that he gave certain talents and certain gifts? Incredible. But this is what David said to God when he began to realize that. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I knew it. Did David take any credit for who he was or what he could accomplish in that verse? Who does he thank for it? God. You see, part of our personal load to carry is to identify and use both our talents and our gifts for God's glory. Use them to make him look good. That's what Paul meant when he wrote this. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 31. Whether you eat or drink, and then look at this next phrase, or whatever you do, no matter what it is that you're doing, whatever talents you have that you can use or whatever spiritual gifts you can have that you can use, whatever it is, what does he say? Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all. Do you think he just accidentally put that word all in there? All for the glory of God. To do something for the glory of God means that you do it in a way that makes God look good. When we're using our talents the way we're supposed to, and we're using our gifts the way we're supposed to, people see less of us and more of him. We don't necessarily look good. It's like Jamie said this morning. People thinking we're crazy out there. But he looks good. You get that? We don't have to look good. We just have to obey. We just have to use what he's given us for his glory. And then he looks good. I want to tell you this, and then we're going to close. Many, many churches in many, many denominations shoot themselves in the foot because they don't make God look good. In fact, they make God look bad when they're judgmental and they're harsh and they're unloving and they're exclusive rather than inclusive. And when somebody comes into their church all marked up and beat up and bruised and battered and tattooed and pierced and all that, stuff that the world does to people and they look at them like what are you doing here that makes god look really bad no wonder we're living in a generation of people who have given up on god that makes him look really bad but when we use our gifts and talents the way we're supposed to that makes god look good and i got to tell you People are attracted to a good-looking God. You get that? So it's part of our personal load to identify and use our talents and identify and use our gifts to make him look good.